name is Benjamin Portnoy. I am the hustler in chief of Side Hustle Elevator, and I'm very pleased to have with me Laura Briggs from sunny St. Paul, Minnesota. It is, by the way, the middle of November, and it is not sunny there from what she tells me, correct? That is correct. Yeah, but I'm happy to be here nonetheless. <laughs> Good. Um, I wanted to mislead everybody and wear short sleeves, but uh, <laughs> nice. people think it's uh, warmer than it is. So here's what we have. Um, my friend Emily told me about Laura, and I did some digging, and this is what I found out. Laura Briggs went from part-time freelancing to, six, to a six-figure freelancing writing business in just 18 months which is awesome. She's the author of Launch Your Own Freelance Writing Business and teaches others how to build fulfilling lifestyle businesses. She is a successful coach, speaker, author, and two-time TEDx speaker, and has delivered keynotes at the Ohio Marketing Edu Educators Association and Randolph College Liberal Arts Symposium. We get all that right? Yes, you did. Nice. Awesome. <laughs> So if you would give us uh, the kind of the one minute extended history of your life and career. I mean, how'd you get here and who are you? Well, I wanted to be a teacher, went to college, got a um, bachelor's degree in economics and political science, went right into grad school to get a master's in political science and was on track to be a professor. So while I was doing my PhD courses at night, I did a program very similar to Teach for America, specific to Baltimore City Public Schools. So with six weeks of training, I was thrown into a high needs classroom in one of the most struggling districts for education all over the United States. Needless to say, I was not that great of a teacher with just six weeks of training, really struggled with that. And so had to figure out where do I go from here? One thing I was really good at as a teacher was creating lesson plans. And I thought, well, maybe there's something to do with writing, creating online marketing that I can teach myself here and jump into that. Um, I also am a military spouse. So I knew that I'd be moving a lot for my husband's career. And so for me, it was about finding something that was flexible and had a lot of freedom associated with it too. So I really fell into freelance writing and it's opened a lot of doors and I've now been doing it for seven years. That's a long time. Yeah, it is. It's actually the longest I've ever held any job. So it's kind of, yeah, crazy. <laughs> the freelancer's curse. Yeah, exactly. Um, so part of the challenge of succeeding as a freelancer is now there are a lot of freelancers in the world. There's some of the barriers have come down and it's easier than ever to do that. So let's just start out with how uh, how do you stand out in a, an already crowded field, a saturated market? Um, and we're, we're going to cover a lot of bases. If you're just tuning in here or watching this after the broadcast, we're going to start with some of the smaller pieces of getting started as a freelancer, but then we really want to talk about how to scale your business because I know you specialize in both, but a lot of people hit that hump of how do I take it bigger? How do I recreate myself. But let's start small. How do you stick out in a crowded marketplace? I think that as freelancers, there's two things. One, you have to know your unique value proposition. You have to know what it is that you do better than most of your competition. And you have to be able to market around that. So I know, for example, um, in the writing world, a lot of people have been burned by freelance writers. They've had duplicate and plagiarized work turned in. They've had writers that ghosted them, that missed deadlines. So I very much market around that to begin with. I think the second aspect of staying ahead of the curve is not marketing yourself as just one thing, seeing trends that are coming down the pike, right? So I've worked with a lot of virtual assistants who say, well, like I can't compete against someone who's overseas and is doing data entry for $5 an hour. Okay, so let's teach you a new and emerging skill set and niche in podcast production, audio engineering, writing show notes. These are things that your customers are more likely to want to keep to US and Canadian freelancers or Australian freelancers to begin with. And it's definitely not something that you're going to charge $5 an hour for. So it's also about diversifying. So most of my clients I do writing for, but I also do content and project management as well. So that there's never, you know, if if AI comes to the point where it can duplicate what I do pretty well, I want to make sure that I'm not left out in the cold. So it's always about expanding your skill set and learning new things too. That's fantastic. So 
what are things that human that if you're watching at least in the US, uh, what's something that a US based human can do that a worldwide uh, talent pool can't do that you can't go. I mean, you can go to YouTube now, what we're watching on, look at the uh, the uh, the uh, transcription because it auto, auto transcribes it. So what's something you're saying, what's something you can do that uh, all of these things can't do? Right. Or what is the extra thing that you throw into it? You know, like, for example, transcription is a great example. You can get transcription done by software. You can pay Rev.com to do it a dollar a minute. So mm. why do I have a transcriptionist as one of my virtual assistants? Because she's doing it properly by putting the right bullet points in there, the right subheaders, the commas in the right places. So that's not something where I'm going to trust a software or someone overseas to potentially get it right, because there's a value added service there and that she knows my market and knows how to take what I, she's transcribing and turn that into a usable blog post or usable show notes. So it's about those little tweaks too. You know, where can you add a little extra customer service, a little mm -hmm. extra assurance to the client that they're getting a best in class service at the end of the day? That's awesome. So let's kind of do devil's advocate here from a client's perspective and just coming back around how do you market yourself to say, instead of paying $5 an hour for transcription, because as a client, I'm seeing I can get this done for $5 an hour. So how do I communicate that through my marketing and show the value of having best in class service? Yeah, I directly call out competitors. I mean, I don't call them out by name or anything, but I will say to my clients, you know, a lot of my clients have hired other writers and have had a bad experience. And I, I will speak to that psychological pain point. Like I'm imagining you're here questioning whether or not to hire anyone at this point in time, because you probably had to write the blog at the last minute yourself or paid so much to get an editor to come in and fix it or had to bring in your senior marketing manager to make it read properly in your brand you know, tone, style, and voice. So I will point that out to them. Like, I get it. I know the obstacles you've encountered before. Here's why working with me is different. And then you leverage any social proof that you have. And even if you're brand new, you've only had three clients who've said what a great experience it was working with you. Get those three clients to leave you a recommendation on your LinkedIn profile. That's social proof that helps put people at ease that you know, even though we do so many things online today, we still have hesitations about handing over our own credit card or our own payment information to essentially a stranger on the internet. So you want to work as much as possible to break down that barrier. It might be getting on a phone call or a Zoom chat with a potential client for five minutes to show, hey, I am a real human on the other side of this computer. I really do care about you and your business. That's awesome. And I do want to come back to LinkedIn. It's interesting you brought that up. Um, because, well, we'll come back to it. Okay. Um, but that's great. I, and you you brought up LinkedIn, but as time goes on, I mean, it used to be 10 years ago, you had to have a website. Mm -hmm. That was your main uh, way of saying, here I am, here's what I do, here's how I can help you. Do you think a website is as important now? And if not, you're shaking your head. If not, um, what's more important now? How do you put yourself out there in a way that you're taken seriously? So I'm a huge fan of freelancers not investing money back into their business until they know they like doing this and have mm -hmm. revenue to do so. So I think a lot of people opt out of freelancing because they're like, I don't have $5,000 to pay a designer to build me a website, or I hate WordPress and tech, so I'm not gonna spend three weeks trying to set up my own website. That's okay. You don't need that at the beginning. We have other tools where you can establish a free portfolio of sorts or a living resume, which is what LinkedIn can function as. So don't cut yourself off from getting started because of this perception that you need a website. Because here's the thing with a website, it's only as good as the traffic that's going to it. So this idea of build it and they will come that doesn't work, right? So unless I have an audience that's gonna go to the website, I'm gonna invest time and money to build it. And then I'm gonna go, man, that didn't work. I posted blogs on my site. I was active there. I was sharing freebies with my audience. No one was there. And that's why I love tools like LinkedIn, where you have a ready and willing audience that wants to talk business, learn business, read about business. Don't 
go into it with this idea of I have to have the website first. Once you have recurring revenue and you're like, I'm solid, I love whatever freelance service that you're providing, then you can say, now it's time for me to build a website because I think I might start to be able to get some traffic from it and see some other benefits as well. But you do not need it when you start. No, I, did awesome. not have, I didn't have one for three years. So no. <laughs> That's awesome. I love the, I, I really like that term living resume. I've, mm -hmm. I haven't heard that before. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about starting with little to no money. Mm -hmm. And I, in talking to my own audience and looking through different forums, a lot of people are starting by saying, I have no money. How do I start this? How do I scale to X number of dollars? I mean, what are some other ways? Obviously, you have social, you have all of these avenues now, and it can be overwhelming, mm -hmm. but it's easier than ever. So what else do you tell clients as far as getting started with zero dollars and making an impact as well, quickly as possible? Yeah, it's a great question. And what I love to do is sell to people who already know you even if it's not the end service you want to provide. So if I'm starting out as a proofreader, as a writer, as a virtual assistant, something like that, I might say, listen to my personal audience on Facebook or on LinkedIn. Hey, you might not know this. I launched a proofreading business. I'm offering a special deal to the next three people. I will proofread your cover letter and your resume. I will make sure it stands out for applicant tracking systems and has all the right keywords in it. The special costs X dollars. Why do that? Because total strangers, it's, we have to like bring them along. Sometimes we have to educate them. We have to figure out what did they want? What are they willing to pay? Whereas someone who's in your personal network who knows you already is much more likely to trust you. That trusting relationship has already been built. So even if I don't want to write cover letters and resumes forever, those are quick wins. I'm going to get cash in the door. It's going to be from people who already know, like, and trust me. Bonus, I get to help someone I know, like, and trust achieve something in their personal life or writing their about page or, you know, whatever you can come up with. That's a small, quick project where you can knock it out of the park. And then you come to them and say, hey, will you give me this testimonial? Will you make a recommendation for me on LinkedIn? Do you have something that I can use as a reference? You know, if someone ever asked me for a reference, can they contact you and you say that you had a good experience working with me? I think those are some of the easiest ways to get started. And then you kind of figure out what you do and don't like from doing those first couple of projects as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So rely on your network mm -hmm. and people you know and uh, help them, they'll help you in return kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Even if you're a website designer and you're like, I haven't even built my own web first website yet, offer an audit of someone else's website. Hey, I'm going to go in. I'm going to make a video of me navigating your website. I'm going to make some recommendations of five things you can do to make it better. So think about processes that other people need where they're going to get a quick win or a lot of value from you doing a small piece of it. And then you get that recommendation or testimonial. Maybe they hire you for future work. Maybe they don't, but you get some experience to come over that hump of, Hey, I've never built a website yet. You know, I don't have that social proof just yet. You can offer other things without saying, Oh, I've got to go offer my services for free to build an entire website for someone. You don't have to do that. So some of what I'm hearing in these responses, you, you obviously know your online marketing. You know a lot of these techniques and ways to entice people. Not everybody listening and watching may have that experience. And I know you're somebody who's very big on education and self-education. So where would I go if I wanted to learn some good techniques for that? As, as I mentioned before, don't pay for something until you have to. We live in a golden age of educational technology where there are probably 50 excellent podcasts all about online marketing. A Amy Porterfield's Online Marketing Made Easy, Pat Flynn's Smart Passive Income. Those are where I would start, right? And then you can find other resources. If you're looking to learn a specific skill, Udemy.com is an excellent resource. You can also probably find tutorials on YouTube, but Udemy often has classes that sell for 10 or $20. So if you're that new email marketing manager and you're like, I've never heard of ConvertKit, I don't know how to use it, or I don't know how to put descriptions on YouTube videos for my clients so that it's effective, 
perspective, there's probably a $10 or $20 course to at least teach you the basics. And then you can start leveraging that on your own to build that out into your own service. But I start with free, check out the podcast, see what interests you, and then go from there. That's when you invest in books, when you invest in courses and coaches and things like that once you're farther down the road. That's fantastic. And uh, a little tip, uh, if a Udemy course is any more than 10 or $20, you can usually, or even those prices, you can usually find a coupon uh, to get it at that price. They are always running sales, always running specials. And I agree with you. I think more people learn stuff from YouTube in this day and age than anywhere else. I They're uh, probably about 10 miles north of us. There's this fantastic winery where uh, it's it's called Blue Epiphany Winery and they or vineyards. These are guys who are ex-military and law enforcement, and they learned they knew nothing about wine. They looked on YouTube, learned how to make wine, and now they have this bustling business. It's fantastic, and it's all thanks to YouTube. Yeah, you've got to pursue your passion. So that's another reason a lot of people get scared of starting an online business because they're like, well, I don't have the experience. I don't have a degree in X, Y, Z. A lot of times that doesn't matter as much as it used to, right? It's about passion. It's about talent. It's about how are you going to put yourself out there to say, I don't know about this, but I'm sure I can learn and then take that and turn that into something else. That's awesome. All right. So we've started the business. We've gotten some of our first clients. We're getting a little bit of money through the door and we're thinking, you know, I, this is a one time client. I'm tired of, of going out every single time. I want these people on retainer. So I have monthly income rolling through the door. How do you approach that with some of your existing clients? Well, you want to make sure that you're positioning yourself with a service that makes sense on a recurring basis to begin with, right? So something where a person is going to need this every single month, maybe every single week, they need something from you and think about how you can properly position that with them. They might not know they need it weekly or monthly. So you might have to do an educational piece here of, hey, here's the statistic I pulled. You really do need to have an email newsletter. You've got all these people visiting your website, but we're not converting them into lifelong fans or buyers. So my email newsletter management services can help provide that. The blogs that I provide, if you're working with someone on podcasts, think about where do people have a consistent need for support? It's almost always around the creation or the distribution of content. Or if you're working with someone that's handling a lot of their own customers, it's customer service. It's making sure that they're consistently keeping good customer service metrics behind the scenes as well. So that's where you start to put together packages where it makes sense for them to go, hey, I already know you. I like you. I trust you. It would be great to take this piece of the online marketing puzzle off of my plate and be able to hand it over to you. A lot of my clients, you know, I didn't discover that on my own. One of my clients just said, hey, uh, I'd like it if you could just write my blog every week. And I'm like, oh, I can do this ongoing. And that was a game changer. It was like, hmm, I need to convert all of my clients to recurring retainers because I get to be more of an expert for them. I do mm -hmm. better and better work for them. I have recurring revenue and they get to know that they're working with someone they can really trust. So I not only get to keep working with them, but they're referring me to other colleagues of theirs because they've had such a good experience. So it is truly a win all around. That's great. Now you, you're bringing up all of these threads I want to pull on here. So first of all, let's talk about uh, just real quick. Somebody hears that and they say, well, I don't know what tools to, I, it seems like you're kind of a, you geek out on tools too and uh, mm -hmm. some of these things. So if I just want to get started with something that charges that recurring income, it's easy to use. I don't have to dial in too much. What is that? What do you suggest? It depends on the type of freelance services that you offer. I think that it comes back to this idea of seeing what's coming ahead of the trend. And so the temptation might be, oh, I'm going to go learn Pinterest and I'm going to become like a Pinterest social media manager, right? Which can be helpful. But what happens if Pinterest closes down? So mm -hmm. I think a lot of business owners are recognizing that they want to own as much of their content and as many of their customers as possible. So in the past, um, it's called digital sharecropping, actually. And one of my mentors taught me about it. She said, you don't want to build your business on Facebook because Facebook owns those people's profiles. And if they shut down or they shut you down, you're out of business. So start thinking about what collateral does a company or a business owner have that you can help them with 
where they own all of it and get the most benefit out of it. So those are email lists. That's website traffic. Those are places on the internet where they are establishing themselves as a thought leader. And so that's where I would start. Teach yourself the absolute basics of website traffic, building a website for mobile readers, for today's disinterested audience that looks at something for two seconds and you have to grab them in that two seconds or they're gone, right? Start learning about the psychology behind that and some of the user experience metrics behind email marketing. I think that can take you a long way because more and more companies are recognizing the power of that themselves and they don't understand it either. And so they're looking for that expert to go, hey, I know we need to blog. I know we need to build a mobile friendly website. I don't know how to do that. And handing that off to you is a great opportunity. Good. And as far as actually charging them every month, what tools do you like to use? Um, I, again, I don't like, um, anything you, that you don't need to pay for. Right. So you can use things like PayPal. Of course, you're going to pay fees for doing that. Um, but it's very easy to set up subscriptions. You can use a more advanced tool like Dubsado, but again, that's going to be something where you are paying for it as the freelancer. So as at the beginning, I definitely ren recommend using something that's like a PayPal. Then you can move to more of a paid invoicing structure using something like FreshBooks or Wave, where they're going to be in a recurring um, model to charge that person every single month. Good. Okay. Uh, the other th thing that came up is, as you were talking about that before, uh, some people have an aversion to and. and there's a lot of psychology behind this, but some people have an aversion to um, suggesting, basically give me more money. They feel like they are asking for money versus um, offering a service. Mm -hmm. So how do you get over that mental block? Yeah, it's a very common mental block. And you have to shift into thinking about what your work does for your clients. And it could be multiple things. It could just be one thing, but it's the one thing that matters the most to them. So for example, a lot of my clients are attorneys. The number one pressure on them is time. So they want freed up time. And if I can position myself that way and think about, you know, oh, this isn't salesy. If I actually say, hey, I've identified these other places where I could help you. The work we're doing is going to be more successful because of it. Oh, and you don't have to think about it at all because I'm handling every aspect of it. Then it becomes more about positioning your yourself as a value. And so you have to stop thinking of it as I'm asking for more money. You are offering more value. You are offering services that your client needs that are going to help them be more successful in the long run. And of course, you can't come at it as, oh, I'm asking for more money because I feel like that sense of desperation and that lack of confidence, it almost gets attached to the conversation you have with the client or attached to the proposal. So you always want to be pitching and proposing from a position of confidence. And so you have to believe that first. Client's never going to sign on if you don't believe it. That's great. And from the way you said it, it sounds like you've had that conversation many times. Yeah, I have, you know, and I think that clients feel they feel it from you when you truly believe that, hey, this is something that's best for you. I'm not just offering this because I want to make more money. This is how I see it fitting into your business. If you can add that extra little bit of, hey, I thought about this and this is why I think it's recommended. And the next step, they like that you've gone that extra mile and, and they like that you're involved in their business more than just, oh, I'm a contractor. You hire me to do X things at X dollars per hour, or X dollars per project. You're really contributing to their business as well. That's great. Um, okay, so let's go back to LinkedIn. Uh, you have a course about growing your business on LinkedIn, and I've seen a lot of people debating LinkedIn at this point, its best uses, its shortcomings, that uh, it's sort of getting overrun with people just pitching each other on a one-to-one -one basis. So what do you suggest as far as that as a, a, a new business platform, a prospecting platform, what are its best uses? What's a uh, good kind of couth when yeah. using it? So for years, I was in the camp of what is the point of my LinkedIn? Like it's up there. It's got my previous positions on it. I don't see a purpose. Mm -hmm. Then I really started testing and playing around with it for about two years to see what is the best use of this? What converts the best? And I think people are already getting tired of, as you mentioned, the outright pitch. So they send a connection request and then five minutes later, it's, hey, I offer this thing. And a lot of times it's not even a thing that I want or need. And it's like, yeah. if you looked at my profile at all, you'd know that 
that I'm not interested in venture capital in any way, <laughs> shape, or form. So why are you pitching me your services to help with venture capital, right? And I think so that's already starting to happen. I see that as coming down the pike. The way that I view LinkedIn, it is my opportunity to share thought leadership. That is all I care about, positioning myself in front of my prospective clients and my community as a thought leader, sharing helpful, free content. And so it's not about that outright pitch. What happens is over time, as you build that and as you do that properly, your clients come to you. Recruiters find you. They may not even interact with your content as you're posting it. It might be someone who's watched you for four months and has never liked, shared, or commented on anything you wrote. And then suddenly they go, hey, I've been seeing your book everywhere. So I'd like to buy it. Where's the best place to buy it? Or I have a question for you about XYZ service. Is that something you do? And so that is a much less salesy approach to it and an easier way to build your audience. So that's that's what I do. I build an audience of ideal prospective clients. I don't accept everyone who sends me a connection request on LinkedIn because I want LinkedIn to see that the content that I publish is highly relevant for my audience. So if I'm posting content that's about you know, automotive mechanics, and I have an audience of attorneys, no one's going to interact with that, read it or like it. And so LinkedIn learns in their algorithm, oh, she's posting useless content. That's not necessarily true. I'm just posting it to the wrong audience, right? So you have You're to relevant. think about who's in my audience, what do they want to read? How can I teach the LinkedIn algorithm how to keep showing my stuff to those people over and over again? So they keep seeing Laura Briggs, like almost to the point where it's annoying. They're like, oh yeah, there's that woman again. Like I've been thinking about hiring a writer. Maybe I should reach out to her. Yeah. So a lot of, uh, you walk the line, it sounds like very well between being able to replicate yourself, scale and grow but still keep things specific to your clients relevant and being uh, not, as we've, this is a, a conversation I've had with people uh, where we talk about in this increasing world of automation, how do we keep things one-to-one -one? and how do we keep things relevant to each person we're interacting with? So it sounds like you're somebody who walks that line very well. I try to, you know, I recognize that there's a lot of things in my business that I should not be doing. So where I have the opportunity to provide the one-on-one -on -one service, uh, basically my zone of genius boils down to two things and it's writing projects for clients or content creation and speaking to clients, whether that's on the phone or on video. So everything else behind the scenes probably shouldn't be done by me because it's not the best use of my time. And so even in my coaching business too, I try to automate as much as I can, you know, here's a freebie, opt in, you're going to get connected to this particular email list. But sooner rather than later, I'm trying to have a one on one interaction with you, even if that's over email, because I don't want you to feel that automated experience or like, hey, here's something, buy it. I want you to get to know me to be able to ask questions to get some value and some quick wins before you ever buy anything. And so I do think it's a difficult it's a hard position to be in. You have to constantly be evaluating. Am I doing enough of the one-on-one -on -one touch points? Am I automating enough where I'm not wasting a ton of my time repeating the same processes over and over? So it's always about trying to balance that. So that's really interesting. Uh, what I hear you saying is that it's a lot about communicating your authentic intention that you do want to serve these people's uh, needs and help grow their business. But a lot of what comes out from other people is it just feels like you're going in one end of the machine and coming out the other versus let's look at your needs, even though they overlap with other people's in the same industry. Would yes. you agree with that? I totally agree because what I've seen over and over again, even with a niche of freelancers, this is why I don't offer group coaching programs. Everyone is at a different point. I've had freelancers who are very successful and they come to me and they say, I'm actually looking for a full-time remote job. Can you help me with that? Yes, I can. But we have to work one on one, right? I have to help you with your resume, with your pitching strategy, with being, you know, recruiter friendly online and all of that. That's a totally different strategy than the same freelancer who might be making that same amount of money per month, but is like, I need to scale. I need to hire a virtual assistant. I need better mm -hmm. clients. So sometimes it doesn't like, uh, sure, I might be able to make more money by saying, oh, here's this magical six step process you all need to do, but they don't all have the end result. So that that is a decision that I've made in my business. The way that I coach, 
I have online courses, but where I get the best results is either the one-on-one -on -one strategy sessions yeah. or the three-month one-on-one coaching because it is so tailored to that person. And they come in and they might not even know what they need yet, but they know that we're going to work on that and get them to that point. And so I think that's where that, you know, one-on-one -on -one touch point, I try to introduce that to people as soon as possible. Like, Hey, yeah, you can buy this course, but honestly, it might not be right for you. And I don't offer refunds. So I want you to email me an app <laughs> and I'll tell you if it's a no, right. And I've told people no. So I think that helps build that genuine relationship with someone where they don't just feel like, oh, I'm getting pitched every other minute to buy yeah. something. Yeah. Good. Uh, what do you enjoy more? Do you, in, uh, you do a lot of things. You, you're a speaker, you're a coach, you're, uh, you help clients as far as freelancing and marketing. What do you enjoy doing the most? That's such a great question. And it's something I battle with all the time because sometimes what I enjoy the most is not necessarily the most profitable or the sure. easiest to turn up the revenue, but it really is coaching clients one-on-one -on -one, um, because that's where I see the best results. That There's always going to be that teacher inside of me, even if I'm not in a traditional classroom. And I, I have found in that process the things that I'm really good at coaching people on, right? And it's helping mm -hmm. people navigate tricky client management problems and boundary pushing issues and getting out of bad contracts. It's a lot of like, you know, dealing with problems. And I really enjoy that. And I like doing that and like getting to see people's businesses grow faster and it, for it to be easier for them too. That's great. So uh, let's we're, let's go back to our uh, our evolution here. We've started the business. We've started to scale. Now we want to take it even higher to the next level. So I want to hire a virtual assistant or eventually a whole team. Mm -hmm. What are some of the first steps to making that happen and recognizing when it is actually time to do it? So I'll start with when it's actually time to do it. And if you are already feeling overwhelmed or like there's not enough hours in the day, you should have hired a VA two months ago. It's not the end of the world that you're thinking about it now. Um, but that's something you want to become more sensitive to because as your business grows, you want to be highly aware of, oh, there's a gap on my team. Someone is overloaded. It might be me. It might be somebody else. We need to create a new position. So you want to start being more aware of those feelings of burnout, overwhelm, feeling like you're spending a lot of time doing administrative tasks. If you have consistent monthly revenue that's coming in from your freelance clients, but you are still wearing all of the hats, it is time to outsource to a virtual assistant. Your first hire is probably going to be someone who is a general virtual assistant, but do not make the biggest hiring mistake, which is making a list of 26 tasks you want to outsource and assuming that this magical unicorn VA is out there who is a level 10 expert in all 26 things. We want to group things together. So it could be a content manager. It could be someone who is researching your potential clients for you. It could be someone who is pitching you to be on podcast, but we might not ask that same person to maintain our website, right? So we want to think about different buckets of tasks. I have a graphic designer VA. I have a general VA who makes a lot of my material, publishes a lot of my blogs. And then I have someone who works specifically on my podcast. So we want to think about how we can group tasks together for things that are outside our zone of genius. Remember, like my two zone of genius, it's talking to people to close them or it's creating content. So if it's outside of that, I have to constantly ask myself, would a CEO be doing this? Would a CEO be sending the invoice or following up with the person who's 10 days late on the invoice? Probably not. So that's yeah. something I need to build into my process. Okay. So recognize when you are <laughs> past feeling overwhelmed mm -hmm. and maybe even before that, and you have the incoming revenue to be able to pay for it. And then, and then once you're looking for that person, recognize they're not going to do everything, but they'll help take some of it off of your plate so you can get more done and bring more business in and handle it. Yeah. And we want to start small with the BA anyways, because a lot of times we don't know if someone's going to work out until they're actually inside our business. They can send in a great pitch or proposal. They can nail the interview you do with them. They might even do a good job on the test project that you offer. And then all of a sudden, they're very hard to get a hold of working yeah. together. So we always want to start small. We don't want to tell someone, oh, I need 40 hours a week of assistance. We're going to start small. Let's see how you do with two to five hours. If it works out, we'll scale it up from there. Yeah. Most uh, most VAs and outsourcers I've hired can always work more hours than uh, you want to initially start with. So yeah, absolutely. And that's a conversation you want to have and be upfront like, hey, I envision this being a one time 10 hour project 
or two to three hours a week to start, it could grow. The right person will rise to the top and over deliver and do a great job so that both of you are excited about the opportunity to work together more. Do you look on Upwork? Do you, where do you look for people to help? Best place is referral. If you have someone in your network who's had a good experience, I'll mm -hmm. also put in a plug for a great free service. It's run by a friend of mine, Gina Horky at the Horky Handbook. She has a community of virtual assistants who pay monthly to get qualified leads. They have all gone through her virtual assistant training program. They write excellent pitches and proposals. And so it's totally free for you to fill that out and to have your material transmitted to a bunch of highly qualified VAs um, right away. So I love that. Check that out. It's right at the top of her website. It's like hire a VA or something like that. And you can fill that out. And I know a lot of people have had good success hiring people through there. Cool. How do you spell Horky? H-O-R-K-E-Y. Okay. <laughs> I spelled it wrong. That's okay. Um, and what do you, do you have, so a long time ago when I was first exploring hiring VAs and hiring people to help, um, I, I don't remember who it was, but they recommended look in the Philippines. And then I've talked to people who say, you know, here are certain demographics you want to look for. So how do you, do you have specific criteria when you're looking for an outsourcer? I do. And it depends on the type of project that's going to be completed. So for mm -hmm. example, I have someone um, overseas who works on updating a lot of my spreadsheets. When we publish new content, he tags everything properly. He colors it a certain way. If it's a podcast versus mm -hmm. a video versus a blog, that's not something where I might need someone in the US to do it, right? That's yeah. something that is kind of not super specific. It could be done easily. But if I'm choosing someone who's going to work one on one, say to write customized pitch pitches for me to appear on a podcast or to put together my speaker kit, I'm probably going to go with someone who is in the United States or the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada. I want someone who has that ability for native English speaking to put together the best package for me, right? And as a writer, I'm always going to be judged very strongly on my writing and communication ability. So for me, that's kind of how I draw the line. You know, is this, a, if it's a video editor and they're in the Philippines and they do an amazing job and they charge less, well, of course I'm going to consider that yeah. person. I'm going to do a test job with them. But if it's something where it's client facing or where it's about, you know, my image and brand on my website or online, I'm going to be a little stricter in who I talk to with that. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Okay, uh, we're coming up on about 40 minutes here. I want to respect your time. I could ask you questions for the next hour, but I want to respect your time. So how are we time wise here? I think we're doing fine. If you have, uh, you know, a couple more questions, if you want to ask okay. them, you're welcome to. So I want to take it in, a, in kind of a different direction. You have a one of your TEDx talks was how self education can solve the US skills gap. First, let's will you define what is the US skills gap? So we have a skills gap in a couple of different ways. So I'm not talking about the massive number of manufacturing jobs that are open. There's definitely a skills gap in that area, but I'm talking about the technical skills gap. And what's happening is we have 108 million jobs, right? There are, I, I'm not sure if it's 108 million or thousand, but there's tons of jobs that are sitting open because employers can't fill them. And what's happening is people are going through the traditional education process. They graduate with a bachelor's, they go on job interviews, they have massive student loan debt. And the first question out of the employer's mouth is, do you know Entreport? Do you know Infusionsoft? Do you know Salesforce? And the student is like, no, I don't know any of that. I don't know any of these online marketing skills. And so there's a major disconnect there. We have lots of really well-paid jobs, with great opportunities for advancement that go unfilled because the way that traditional education is set up is not necessarily training people to be successful with that. And there's also a huge aversion to freelancing in the traditional education world. Like professors don't like it. They think it's unstable. And it's like, but wait a minute, if we had students working on freelance projects or even modeling freelance projects in the classroom in high school and college, they'd have experience with this software. They could turn it into a business. They could make extra income or they could use it in their job interviews to say, yeah, I haven't done it in a business setting yet, but you know, we built a comprehensive social media marketing plan for X company while I was in college. And these were the results that we had. So I feel like we can do a lot better of a job in connecting people with what the economy and workforce looks like 
today because education is like 20 or 30 years behind connecting that. And so a lot of people are getting frustrated on both ends. Employers are like, I can't find people I need for this job. And graduates are like, I'm graduating with massive debt and I can't find a job that pays decently. Yeah. So that's interesting. I, I have seen some universities starting to offer online marketing programs and this and that. Uh, but your talk was about self-education. Mm -hmm. So would you make the same recommendations that you did earlier as far as YouTube videos and Udemy and places like that? Uh, or are there other places to get more scaled education that an employer might want? So I would say that you want to do a mix of both this mm -hmm. and it's not to trash a traditional college education, right? We learn a, a tremendous amount of helpful critical thinking and communication skills and written skills in that type of a classroom. But while you're in high school and college, when the stakes are low and your future employment isn't riding on it and you're like, hmm, I've always loved the idea of being a voiceover artist. I wonder if I should try it try it out, explore that passion, take that $10 course, listen to the podcast, pick up the $15 ebook and explore that passion while the stakes are low. Because when you start from there and you start to teach yourself things and learn as you go, you're in the best possible position on graduation because you can say, am I going to take this as a business or am I going to keep it as a side hustle and use these skills I picked up to get a really great traditional job? And so that's what I would encourage is I think a lot of students enter education and they're like, well, I did what everyone told me to. I went to the four-year institution. I got the degree. I, you know, when I left my master's program, I, I had to take an entry-level job answering phones at an insurance agency. It was a real wake-up call. Like, oh, I thought I did the right thing by spending six years in higher education. But the truth is I wasn't really prepared for the type of jobs that were out there. So take that on yourself to say, how can I be as competitive as possible on graduation? What passions and skills can I develop now and not have it attached to like, oh, I'm interested in voiceover work. That's the be all end all. No, explore it. View yeah. it like Tim Ferriss. It's an experiment. You might hate it. And that's helpful information to know too. Yeah, that's great. And along those lines, um, how do you say, you sound like somebody who's really trying to stay on that edge and watching what is coming our way in the next five, 10, 20 years. First of all, who, how are you doing that? Um, who are some of the thought leaders you follow aside from the ones you mentioned, Pat Flynn, uh, Amy Porterfield, Tim Ferriss, who are some people who are just visionaries, maybe ones we haven't heard of before, who are helping you realize that and where else are you keeping on top of things? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I would say more more than people, it's about companies or websites that I see as being at that cutting edge. So as a search engine optimization writer, I'm always following people like Brian Dean of Backlinko, or you're following companies like Moz, because you want to see what they're putting out as saying what the coming trends are. You also want to watch the big players and what they're doing. A great example of this is Amazon. That's not my target client, right? But look at what they're investing in, what is working on their particular platform. You can take a lot from that. Even the fact that they're putting out digital voice assistants like Alexa. Okay, what does that mean for me as a writer? If people are speaking into a voice assistant to do their Google search, I have to think about that as a writer. Mm -hmm. What titles do I pick? What subheaders do I use? So that's why I try to follow companies that are always trying to innovate as well, because there's usually a lesson in there. If they're putting enough research and development money behind it, if they're deploying these major initiatives, that should tell me something even as a solopreneur. Yeah, that's great. And have you identified any trends that are on the way that we should know about? Well, one thing that I think, it, well, there's a couple, but one that I think is absolutely huge is the power of podcasting. It's changing a lot of things. It's creating a lot of jobs and a lot of potential services for freelancers that did not exist before. People love listening to information you know, audibly. I think we even see that in how many people are purchasing audio books. So that's something mm -hmm. for authors to pay attention to, you know, make sure you've set yourself up for success with audio books. I think another thing that's coming down the pike, it's currently highly unregulated, but in this digital world we live in, how are we friendly towards people with disabilities? Is mm -hmm. my website something easily navigated and read by a person who is hearing impaired, who is visually impaired. We don't have regulations on that yet, but we are starting to see lawsuits bubble up around that. And so we want to think about that as we build our own <clears> online <throat> presence 
or as we help clients with that, you know, it's not just about those mobile readers. How do we make this as inclusive as possible for everyone? So I think that's definitely a trend that I'm thinking in the next five to 10 years, we're going to start to see some government regulations about what has to be on websites or how that, you know, if you put out a video, you might have to have captions on it, for example. Yeah, I've uh, I have a client who was dealing with that, the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, websites that the alt tags needed to be yep. filled in and uh, just people with I, that's I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, well, great there. I have three other quick questions. OK, these are fun ones. OK, uh, what kind of music or artists or whatever gets you through the day? So I listen to focus music when I'm working, but my absolute favorite music is classic rock. I was raised um, in Northwest Ohio where classic rock is just a big thing. Almost all of the major artists come through there. Uh, my husband took me to Van Halen fourth row a couple of years ago. So I will always return to classic rock to pump me up. Awesome. Uh, the Who was here <sighs> in uh, probably a month and a half ago. And Roger, because of Houston allergies, Roger, as soon as he got off the plane, started <laughs> feeling it. And within seven songs, they had to stop. So they're, they're coming back in like five months to finish the show. Hopefully Houston will cooperate. Next question. What, and this is two questions in one, what beverage starts your day and what beverage ends your work day? Well, the beverage that starts my day is hands down coffee, like get out of the way if I haven't had it yet. And then the beverage that ends my day, I'm terrible at drinking water. So I always like before I go to bed, it's like, hmm, how much water did I have today? Oh, not enough. So I might <laughs> consume a lot at that point. What about so first of all, what kind of coffee? I, well, sometimes I drink bulletproof coffee, which I don't know okay. if you're familiar with, um, but I'll do that. Or I'll just do like a traditional K cup caramel vanilla cream with some hazelnut creamer is okay. like my favorite. Okay. And water is great before you go to bed, but when it's quitting time, what is your quitting time beverage? Like alcoholic drink type of thing? If, if you choose <laughs> or something else. Oh man. That's a good question. I don't know that I really have like a specific quitting time beverage, but if I am, you know, out and about, like going out to dinner or going out to cocktail hour, it's going to be something that's fruity that has rum in it for sure. Oh, nice. Nice. <laughs> Houston has a couple rum distilleries that oh, I cool. have been meaning to go to. Yeah. Okay. This has been awesome. There's so much information and I can't wait to get it transcribed to, uh, to put it all in notes. Uh, but how do we learn more about you? What's the best way just to, you know, give us a call to action here. Follow me on LinkedIn. Even if you, even if you're just doing that to scope out what I'm doing, right. Um, or also check out my website, which is betterbizacademy.com. Um, you can get a lot of great free information there. And I have a podcast that you can link to there called advanced freelancing. That's all about scaling your freelance business. That's awesome. Laura Briggs, we've been talking with, um, this has been fantastic. We, I really feel like we, we got a lot of good stuff out of this. So anything you want to uh, add before we hang up here? No, just thanks for having me. Yeah, you're very welcome. All right. This is Benjamin Portnoy from Side Hustle Elevator. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.